The title of my sermon today is The Personal Work of the Holy Spirit. You know, Jesus spent a lot of time talking uh, to his apostles about the Holy Spirit on the night of the Last Supper. Uh, Pastor covered that last week when he spoke about the abundant energy resource of the Holy Spirit, which the Holy Spirit would provide to those uh, for whom Christ had commissioned to work. This week I'd like to go through the Bible and see how the Holy Spirit worked in various times and circumstances to carry out the purposes of the Father in the lives of people like you and I. So we can understand how the Holy Spirit works in the lives of believers today. If there's one scripture uh, text that this sermon is based on, it's what Jesus told his apostles in the upper room that night after Judas Iscariot left. It's over in John 14, verse 18. He said, I will not leave you as orphans, but I will come to you. I'd like to begin our study by letting God describe how he accomplishes the things he wants done on earth. And it's found over in Zechariah 4 and verse 6. It says, This is the word of the Eternal to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Eternal Almighty. Now, what's the occasion of God talking to Zerubbabel? And who was Zerubbabel? Right? Those are a good couple questions. Uh, in 598 BC, the kingdom of Judah was conquered by Babylon. And about 50,000 Jews were marched out of Judah into Babylon. They were taken as exiles. But in 538 BC, King Cyrus allowed the Jews to return. This was a prophecy that Isaiah had given hundreds of years beforehand, even named Cyrus in the prophecy. All right, Zerubbabel was one of the exiles who returned to Jerusalem from Babylon. He had been tasked with rebuilding the temple. That was the whole purpose, to let the Jews go back so that they would rebuild the temple to the great God. And Cyrus saw this, and he wanted that done. Now, uh, he faced a huge task. Zerubbabel faced a huge task. When Solomon built the first temple, he had all kinds of resources. He had the spoils of war from the wars that David had fought and won. He had uh, private contributions from his father, David, who amassed a lot of wealth and put it toward the building of the temple, right? Uh, he had donations from the people who wanted the temple to be built. He also had, uh, he had no worry about other nations around him because he had standing armies and he had peace on all sides. He was secure, right? He didn't have to worry about that. Well, that wasn't the case with Zerubbabel. His resources were severely limited, and he faced hostile opposition from the rulers who lived in the area. They didn't want the temple to be rebuilt. So the rebuilding that God wants will be accomplished through the power of the Holy Spirit. So if we move down in Zechariah a little bit. Here's what God continued in verse 9. The angel who spoke to Zechariah continued in verse 9. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands will also complete it. Then you will know that the Eternal Almighty has sent me. Now, that's how God does his work on earth, through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit makes his appearance very early in the Bible. Okay, uh, In Genesis 1, verse 2, we read, Now the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So this is, in fact, the entire rest of that first chapter of Genesis has that point of view. It's the waters, the Spirit hovering above it, and the earth blanketed in a huge cloud that made the earth dark. That's why it was covered in darkness. The earth and the, the, uh, the sun, moon, and stars existed, but they were not visible from earth because of the darkness of that cloud. We learned that from Job. So as God prepared the earth for life, the Holy Spirit was there to fulfill God's desires. Then in the book of Exodus, Moses is given extensive plans for making the tabernacle and its furnishings. And if you read through there, I mean, the, the plans are very extensive, all the things that have to be put into it. Um, and this is the, the tent that Israel transported wherever it went, along with the Ark of the Covenant and the, the uh, altar and all those kind of things. Moses had the plans, but he needed someone to do the work. And here's how God provided it. This is from Exodus 31, verses 1 through 5. Then the Eternal said to Moses, 
Look, I have specifically chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, grandson of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. I have filled him with the Spirit of God, giving him great wisdom, ability, and expertise in all kinds of crafts. He's a master craftsman, expert in working with gold, silver, and bronze. He's skilled in engraving and mounting gemstones and in carving wood. He's a master at every craft. Now keep in mind, until a few months earlier, Bezalel was a slave in Egypt. How could he have acquired all these skills? They came from the Holy Spirit. The people uh, donated all the materials needed to build the tabernacle, the tent and its furnishings. And as construction is about to get underway, here's what Moses said. This is Exodus 35, verse 30. Then Moses said to the Israelites, See, the Eternal has chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, and son of, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And he has filled him with the Spirit of God, with wisdom, with understanding, with knowledge, and with all kinds of skills, to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood and to engage in all kinds of artistic crafts. And he's given both him and Oholiab, son of Ahis, Ahisamach of the tribe of Dan, the ability to teach others. He has filled them with skill to do all kinds of work as engravers, designers, embroiders in blue, purple, and scarlet, yarn, and fine linen, and weavers, all of them skilled workers and designers. That's an awful lot of skill. And as we go deeper, we learn that they were able to mix uh, perfumes and ointments and things of that sort as well. So the point is that when God wants something done, he fills people who are to do it with the Holy Spirit. As you can see from the examples I gave, the Holy Spirit fulfills different roles in different people, depending on God's purposes. Zerubbabel needed the gift of leadership in order to accomplish the temple rebuilding in the face of opposition. Bezalel and Aholiab needed craftsman skills and teaching skills in order to follow the plans God gave Moses and to make everything according to those specifications. Now, the Holy Spirit also came upon Balaam. Balaam. You remember him? Balaam? Okay, Balaam. The guy whose donkey talked to him? All right. He was hired to curse Israel. What? The Holy Spirit prevented Balaam from cursing Israel, even as he had been hired to do. The Holy Spirit did that. He came upon Gideon, and he enabled him with a small band of men armed with jars, torches, and horns to defeat the vast Midianite army along with their allies. That's over in Judges 6 and 7. The Holy Spirit came upon Jephthah in Judges 11, and he was able to defeat the Ammonites. The Holy Spirit came upon Samson many times. You can read that section in uh, Judges 13 through 15, giving him supernatural strength, but unfortunately, not a lot of wisdom. Okay, Samson had some problems. Now consider this also. It was the Holy Spirit which enabled Jesus to do the work he did. In his hometown synagogue, Jesus read uh, this prophecy from Isaiah 61. He said, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has ordained me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Notice also, immediately after his baptism in the Jordan, after John the Baptist witnessed the Holy Spirit coming upon Jesus like a dove, we read in Luke 4, verses 1 and 2, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. The Holy Spirit led and inspired Jesus throughout his life. You know, when Jesus spoke to Nicodemus in John 3, he told him that the Father gave him the Holy Spirit without limit. Jesus had unlimited supply of the Holy Spirit. Now, there have been some misunderstandings about the Holy Spirit, the purpose and work of the Holy Spirit in the lives of some Christ followers. Some think that his presence is a special privilege that only some people get, but that's not true. That's not true. When John the Baptist was asked why he baptized with water. Here's what he said in Matthew 3.11. I baptize you in water for repentance, 
But after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire. So on the day of Pentecost, after Peter explained to the people that they had crucified the Messiah, they asked, what shall we do? And here's what Peter answered, Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's to every one of them, all right? So understand, the gift of the Holy Spirit is for everyone who repents and is baptized to indicate their desire to leave their former life with its sin and have it washed away in the waters of baptism. In Romans 8, Paul describes what happens when the Holy Spirit enters the life of a believer. But before we look there, I'd like to look at what Samuel told King Saul as the Holy Spirit was about to enter him. So we can get an idea how that works. Uh, Over in 1 Samuel 10, Samuel anointed Saul as king. He then gives Saul directions about where he is to go and about some prophets that he's going to meet along the way. And in 1 Samuel 10 and verse 6, Samuel tells Saul, The Spirit of the Lord will come powerfully upon you, and you will prophesy with them, with these prophets that he meets along the way. And you will be changed into a different person. Then in verse 9, uh, it says, As Saul turned to leave Samuel, God changed Saul's heart, and all these signs were fulfilled that day. All the things that Samuel had told him. Unfortunately, God's spirit did not remain with Saul because being king went to Saul's head and led by his pride, he disobeyed God. So what is the difference between Saul's experience and our experience under the new covenant in the New Testament? God chose Saul and had him anointed as king while he was in search of his father's donkeys. He had no idea this was going to happen. All the events of his anointing and coronation were a surprise to Saul. He was thrust into a position he had not sought, and so he failed to trust and obey the God who had appointed him as king. He started out humble, but he became great in his own eyes. And then the Holy Spirit left him. In our case, the Holy Spirit first works with us, preparing us and drawing us to Jesus and his teachings. Jesus said over in the uh, John six forty four that we could not come to him unless the Spirit of his Father drew us to him. So that's what happened at first. But then he explained over in John 14, we're up, back up in the upper room, uh, John 14, 15 to 17, he said, If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever. The Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. Okay? In preparing people, he's with them. After they have responded in repentance and obedience, the Holy Spirit is then in them. All right? Uh, Jesus tell us, tells his followers the condition of receiving the Holy Spirit is to keep his commands. In Acts 5.32, Peter says that God gives his Holy Spirit to those who obey him. So our repentance, which is shown by our baptism, indicates our desire to obey Jesus. Remember what Peter told the people on Pentecost? Repent, be baptized, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So when the Holy Spirit begins to work in our lives, we too have our hearts changed, just as Saul did. Just like Samuel told Saul, we're changed into different people. Now, okay, now we're ready to look at what Paul had to say uh, in Romans 8. Let's begin over in verse 1. Paul says, so now there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. You know, Paul uses the phrase in Christ over a hundred times in his letters. He's referring to people who have the Holy Spirit dwelling in them. Jesus described this concept to his apostles as he spoke to them in the upper room again after Judas left. In John 14, verse 8, 
Philip asks Jesus to show them the Father. Jesus replies in verses 9 and 10. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it's the Father living in me who is doing the work. Just as the Father lived in Jesus by the Holy Spirit, Jesus lives in us. Go down to verses 18 and 20. I will not leave you as orphans, he says. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore. But you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Now, when he said in that day, he's referring to when the Holy Spirit came to them, about seven and a half weeks later on the day of Pentecost. Notice also what Jesus prayed on that same night. This is in John 17, verses 20 and 20 to 22. I pray also for those who will believe in me through the apostles' message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them, and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. You know, when the Holy Spirit is in us, God is in us. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If we have the Spirit in us, we have the Son and the Father in us as well, because God is one. That's what Paul means when he refers to believers as being in Christ. So knowing this then, it's quite understandable when Paul writes in verse 9 of Romans 8, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. The only way one can be a Christian is to have the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit has to be active in their life. Now, Jesus told Nicodemus in John 3, verse 8, that to see the kingdom of God, it was necessary to be born of the Spirit. In fact, all the promises that are outlined in Romans 8 mean absolutely nothing for anyone who is not in Christ, anyone not born of the Spirit. So there are some who quote Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work for good for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. But if they're not born of the Spirit, it doesn't apply to them. They don't love God, nor have they been called according to His purpose, if they don't have the Holy Spirit. Acknowledging one's sin and seeking forgiveness through Jesus' sacrifice is of the first importance in the life of anyone. There's an Indian pastor who told a story of a rich merchant that was being rowed across uh, the river by the village boatman. As they started across, the merchant began to relate how many schools he had been to and how many books he had read. How far did you study in school, he asked the boatman. Sir, the boatman answered, I've never been in school in all my life. I can't read or write. Too bad, you've lost one-fourth of your life, remarked the merchant. Then he began to relate how far he had traveled and all the great sights he had seen. How much traveling have you done, he asked the boatman. I have never set foot outside this country, came the boatman's reply. You unfortunate man, you have missed half of your life, commented the merchant. Then he began to boast of his wealth, his fields and houses and bank account. How much money have you put away in the bank during your lifetime? He asked. Sir, I have no money in the bank. I live from hand to mouth. Poor man, you've lost three-fourths of your life, remarked the merchant. Suddenly, in midstream, a strong gust of wind overturned the boat, throwing both men into the water. The boatman started swimming strong strokes toward the shore. Help, help, cried the merchant. I'm drowning. What? called the boatman. With all your money and education and travel, you never learned how to swim? I'm telling that you that you're about to lose your whole life. <laughs> so, no matter how successful anyone is in life, by human standards, without the indwelling Holy Spirit, they're dead men and women walking. Now, my sermon title is The Personal Work of the Holy Spirit. So then, what is the personal work of the Holy Spirit in your life and mine? Now, recall when the Holy Spirit came on King Saul, God changed his heart. A changed heart is the very promise of the new covenant which Jesus ushered in by his death. When Jesus died, the old covenant which God established with Israel 
ended and the new covenant began. Not just with Israel, but as Peter said in Acts 2.39, the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. So the new covenant is for anyone whom God calls. And what are the terms of the new covenant? God describes it in Jeremiah 31, 33. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Eternal. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. So as with Saul, God promises to change the heart of the believers. So the Apostle Paul describes how God accomplishes this in Romans 8, 3 to 4. This is from the Phillips translation. The law never succeeded in producing righteousness. The failure was always the weakness of human nature. But God has met this by sending his own son, Jesus Christ, to live in that human nature which causes all the trouble. And while Christ was actually taking upon himself the sins of men, God condemned sinful nature so that we're able to meet the law's requirements. So long as we're living no longer by the dictates of our sinful nature, but in obedience to the promptings of the Spirit. So it's the Holy Spirit which puts God's law into our minds and writes it on our hearts. So here's some of the facets of the personal work of the Holy Spirit. Teaching. In John 14, 26, The Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Now, as Pastor said last week, to be reminded of everything Jesus said, we must first be familiar with what Jesus said in our Bibles. And we can't be reminded of something we've never known. Uh, John 15, 26, when the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. He reveals Jesus and he draws us to him, like Jesus said in John 6, 44. Then another facet is the relationship with God. The indwelling Holy Spirit identifies each of us as God's children. Romans eight fifteen. You see, you've not received a spirit that returns you to slavery, so you have nothing to fear. The spirit you have received adopts you and welcomes you into God's own family. That's why we call out to him, Abba, Father, as we would address a loving daddy. Before we receive the gift of God's grace, we are homeless orphans searching for some place to belong. But now all that has changed. The Father reaches out through his Son to all those orphaned by sin and death, and he brings them into his, into his family. We're adopted into his forever family and fully enfranchised as his heirs. It helps us in human relationships. John 13, 34, A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Now, an impediment to human relationships is often the difficulty of forgiving those who have wronged us. The Holy Spirit brings forgiveness into focus. When we comprehend, from the point of view of the Holy Spirit, what we have been forgiving of, forgiven of, then forgiving others becomes easier. We see what we essentially have been forgiven of. Remember what Jesus told his disciples after he taught them the sample prayer over in Matthew 6, 15? He said, but if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive you your sins. So God's Spirit unites all believers. Prayer. Uh, Romans 8, 26. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. Now, obviously, God in us should make it easier for us to communicate with him. And then it says, he seals us. This is over in Ephesians 1, uh, verse 13. Because you too have heard the word of truth, the good news of your salvation, and because you believed in the one who is truth, your lives are marked with his seal. This is none other than the Holy Spirit, who is promised as the guarantee toward the inheritance that we are to receive when he frees and rescues all who belong to him. So the Holy Spirit is God's down payment 
on the future he's promised us as his children. And it's through the indwelling Holy Spirit that we have what Jesus promised over in John 10, verse 10. He said, my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Sharing. Okay, there's another point. Uh, when the Holy Spirit came upon the church on the day of Pentecost, he inspired those he filled with a specific purpose. In Acts 2, 9 through 11, we learn that people from all different nations heard them declaring the wonders of God in their own languages. The Holy Spirit gave these followers of Jesus the ability to teach others by speaking languages unfamiliar to them. What specifically were the wonders of God that they spoke of? They spoke about Jesus. John, again, from the upper room, John 16, 13 to 14. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak of his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it's from me that he will receive he will make what he will receive and he will make it known to you. So I don't have time to go into Galatians 5 and the fruits of the Spirit. Uh, we made a whole sermon series out of that. But I'd like to touch on one more matter. Okay, Even though we have the Holy Spirit, we're not immune from sin's power. From time to time, we will sin. When that occurs, we grieve the Holy Spirit. And if we don't repent of that sin, we can actually quench the Holy Spirit and its influence in our lives. In 2 Timothy 1.6, Paul writes, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying out of my hands. So to keep the Holy Spirit active in our lives, uh, we must keep our distance from sin in order to stay close to God. When we do sin, as we all will, we must seek forgiveness quickly. Reminding, reminding us of what John said, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Ephesians uh, 5.18 says, Don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Let me close with an example from Corey Ten Boom as she explained how the work of the Holy, how the Holy Spirit worked in her life. She said, I have in my hand here a glove. The glove can't do anything by itself, but when my hand is in it, it can do many things. True, it's not the glove, but my hand in the glove that acts. We are gloves. It is the Holy Spirit who is in the hand. Who is the hand? Who does the work? Who does the job? We have to make room for the hand so that every finger is filled. Let's pray. Eternal God, as we come to you, thankful for the promise of the Holy Spirit and the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Help us to, to submit to the Spirit. Help us to draw close to you, to repent of sin, and to turn from it so that we might be able to grow in the Spirit. We thank you, and we come to you in Jesus' name. Amen.